everyone. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I'm Zach Hancock, an evolutionary biologist who specializes in population genetics, phylogenetics, and genome evolution. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most enduring metaphors in evolutionary biology, that of the adaptive landscape. Now, if you're familiar with this channel, you know most of the times I do videos that are have lots of like mathematical underpinnings. Um, we really try to dig into um, the nitty gritty details, but this video is going to take a little bit of a step back and we're going to try to think about this concept more conceptually. The goal of this video will be for you to really come away with a deeper understanding of the evolutionary process without necessarily bogging you down in all of the complex mathematical details. So just in case you're not familiar with the adaptive landscape metaphor, it basically works like this. So imagine organisms as sort of complex composites of different phenotypes, right? So long fur, short fur, sharp teeth, blunt teeth, big ears, small ears, all of the different possible phenotypes that an organism might have. Um, and then all of those phenotypes are further coded by an even more complex composite of genotypes, right? And there's a gazillion different combinations of genotypes that can produce a bunch of different combinations of phenotypes, okay? Second is that certain phenotypic combinations, and hence genotypic combinations, are better in some environments than in others. Hence, adaptation is the process of finding these very specific specific combinations in the given environment that an organism lives in. Therefore, we can think about the adaptive landscape as representing sort of a, a topography of all possible combinations, right? So this is a the very first figure, as far as I know, of, uh, of the adaptive landscape. It was from Wright, 1932. And so each one of the different points all across this landscape represents some unique novel combination of phenotypes or genotypes, okay? Um, and some of these combinations are better than others in terms of your reproductive or survival advantage, right? Um, and so if we represent all possible combinations in this way, it creates a sort of topographic landscape with valleys of low and peaks of high fitness. And hence adaptation is the process of moving through this landscape and finding some peak of fitness. Now, the adaptive landscape metaphor helps us to understand several key ideas in evolutionary theory that otherwise seem a little complex and disconnected. So first, it allows us to elucidate the relationships between natural selection, genetic drift and mutation. Again, if you're familiar with the content on this channel, you know that I really try to promote a holistic view of the evolutionary process, not as one solely driven by natural selection, but one that fundamentally requires all of the different mechanisms of evolution to explain biological diversity. And I really think the adaptive landscape metaphor helps us to see that uh, in action. Um, second is that it demonstrates how selection reduces the genetic variance and how the amount of genetic variance within a population determines the rate at which it can adapt. Um, and that is, i.e., Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection. If you're familiar with some of the previous videos where we derive that. Um, third is that it explains and indeed predicts evolutionary stasis and rapid adaptation, so-called punctuated equilibria. Um, fourth is that it makes clear the concept of genetic load. So what this actually means um, and how the distribution of mutational effects evolves through time as a population adapts to certain local peaks. Um, fifth, it demonstrates how mutational bias can actually drive evolutionary patterns. Um, it illustrates how pleiotropy, this is the interaction between traits, so changing one trait has some effect on another trait. So it illustrates how this pleiotropy um, can actually alter the directionality of selection as you're moving through this adaptive landscape. Um, and then lastly, it shows how ecological divergence and further stabilizing selection can drive the formation of species boundaries. So it allows us to connect sort of the microevolutionary processes of populations to broader macroevolutionary patterns. The adaptive landscape metaphor is really, really good at sort of bridging that gap between these two disciplines. Okay, so those are all the things that we're going to discuss. Um, and the way that we're going to walk through this is we're going to start off with this landscape, okay? 
So everything in the cool colors represent sort of the valleys of fitness. So these are the, the low fitness areas. And then as you're climbing up the peaks, those are representing areas of higher fitness. Uh, the the Z axis here is mean population fitness. And you can see in the center, there is one highest peak of fitness um, within this particular landscape. And I'm going to point out that down here on the bottom left, I'm going to include the individuals that first proposed the ideas as we're sort of walking through them. Um, so again, the adaptive landscape idea uh, originates with Wright. There's a little bit of a mention of it in his 1931 paper, Evolution of Mendelian Populations, but he really develops the idea thoroughly in the 1932 uh, subsequent paper. Okay, so this is the, the landscape that we're going to walk through as we try to understand conceptually how adaptation works um, and how it helps us understand all the different processes that interact um, in evolution. So let's imagine some population of finches that uh, colonize some new location. It could be some brand new island, right? They colonize this new location and they have some mean population fitness. And that mean fitness is represented by this little red dot here. Uh, and then this is just like a cartoon of what the individual might look like. Maybe they have dark feathers and a long, narrow beak. And since these individuals have just colonized this new landscape, they have very low fitness. They are maladapted to this environment. Now, the highest peak of fitness, obviously evolution doesn't know that it's trying to get them anywhere, but the phenotypic combinations that would provide them with the highest fitness advantage would be if they had brown feathers and a short stubby beak. Okay, and so all the movements through this landscape represent different combinations of phenotypic traits, as we mentioned previously, and the quote unquote optimal combination of traits in this given environment at this particular time would be the combination of traits sitting at that highest peak. So another thing to bear in mind is that as these individuals are colonizing this new landscape, they have some genetic variants. So the red dot represents the mean, not any one individual's phenotypic or genotypic combinations. Um, there's a, a, you know, a series of different combinations that represents the genetic variants in that population. So I've shown that here by this lighter red circle that spreads out around that mean. So there's a bunch of individuals that are occupying different places in this fitness landscape. Now, importantly, the amount of genetic variance within a population is determined by the size of that population. Uh, this makes intuitive sense. So the more individuals you have, the more mutational targets you have, and hence you will have a greater genetic variance. So we can see that as the genetic variance spreads out in this landscape, individuals are occupying more and more positions within it. Now notice that initially all the individuals within the population that are just you know, just colonize this new landscape have low fitness. They are selectively equivalent. They have different phenotypes, but none of them in this particular environment convey very high fitness. So what this means is that the early parts in adaptation or the early parts in moving through this fitness landscape are driven by genetic drift. Genetic drift being the stochastic fluctuations of allele frequencies from one generation to the next. So the amount of variance in that mean trait, every single generation, if it's driven solely by drift, will be just a function of the population size. So for very large populations, that variance will be very small. Small populations will have very large variances where they make big jumps around that low fitness area. But notice what happens once they reach sort of a basin of a peak, right? So when they get to the bottom of some, of some nearby peak, selection can then start to see that movement through the landscape. So the moment you take a step up that peak, selection recognizes that phenotypic combination as beneficial, and that individual starts to, to have more offspring than the average in the population. Now, when that happens, any subsequent change, any subsequent genetic variance that will take you in a step downward is discarded by selection, right? It's under negative selection. And so all of the genetic variance then begins to contract begins to contract and you begin to rapidly move to an area of high fitness. And that would be represented by the little peak on our hill right here. Hence, a key feature of natural selection is that it acts to remove the genetic variance of the population, right? Because once you're on that little peak, any additional genetic variance is acting to move you away from that peak. So, so, let, so selection is, is sort of whittling down that variance. Um, importantly, the rate at which a population can find that peak and then the rate at which it can climb that peak 
is determined by the standing levels of genetic variation in that population. And this is what Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection um, states, right? That the, that the rate of adaptation is equal to the genetic variance in fitness. So selection is acted to reduce that variance as the population is adapting, but once they're now on that fitness peak, they will still get subsequent mutations that will begin to increase the variance once again. But remember, as that variance is beginning to increase, most of it is going to pull you off of that peak, right? So many of the subsequent mutations are actually going to be deleterious and they're going to be reducing your mean population fitness. And this is what we call the genetic load. So the difference between the optimal phenotype in the population and the mean phenotype of the population, that, that difference is, the, is a measure of the genetic load. Now, in general, we think about the genetic load as a negative thing, right? It's reducing mean population fitness. It's acting to try to drag you off of that peak and selection is constantly having to sort of counterbalance it. But notice how the genetic load here is actually a really important component of populations to be able to explore subsequent peaks. So to understand this, let's think about the case in which the population size is really, really large, right? So when the population is really large, it produces a lot of genetic variation because there's a lot more mutational targets. But since the population is so large, selection is very, very efficient. And so selection is going to be constantly purging that variation and keeping that population tightly bound to the peak of fitness that they're presently sitting on. Um, and what that means is that that population doesn't get enough genetic variance to explore any of the neighboring peaks. Because remember, we've adapted to this peak, which is not the highest peak in the population. That's this one, right? So to get from this peak to this peak, we need genetic variants to permit us to cross this valley. But if selection is too efficient, you will never be able to cross that valley. It will always keep you in the local optima, even if that local optima is not the global optimum. Alternatively, if your population is too small, then it doesn't produce enough genetic variation in the first place, right? So you don't have as many mutational targets, you have much smaller genetic variation, and so you can't, you also are not going to be as efficient at exploring other peaks because your genetic variation is just so small. Um, and so this all kind of goes back to right shifting balance theory, which he first talked about again in 1931 and then developed it further in subsequent papers. But his basic idea was that the actual populations that are the best at exploring the sort of fitness landscape are not the very big ones where selection is very efficient or the very small ones, but sort of the Goldilocks zone populations that are in the middle. Right, so they produce enough genetic variation to be able to explore subsequent peaks, but they're not so large that selection is overbearingly strong and prevents them from ever exploring any neighboring peaks. So in this example, the population begins to grow in genetic variance, um, despite most of that variance, importantly, being a component of the genetic load, right? A great deal of that variance is deleterious and it's acting to move the population away from that mean, but it's also permitting them to explore any subsequent neighboring peaks. Now, given that this process is actually acting against natural selection, it's pretty slow. So most of the time the population is going to spend its mean trait value on that smaller local optimum peak. However, by chance alone, by genetic drift acting against selection, if any individual happens to get the phenotypic combinations that puts them at that basin of that new peak, selection can then pick it up and rapidly move that population to the new higher peak, right? So then drift and mutational pressure allows further adaptation in an otherwise stable fitness landscape. So that's another key thing here is we're assuming that the fitness landscape itself has not changed. Right, so the environment is relatively stable. There's not any new predators or anything like that. So the shape of the fitness landscape is staying the same. Um, and so if populations want to explore additional peaks in a stable landscape, then all the shifts between those peaks are genetic drift acting against selection. Again, importantly, this can only occur if the population is not too big in size, such that selection is incredibly efficient.
So now we've been kind of talking about population, spending time on these little local optima, and then genetic drift acting against selection to move them between those optima. Obviously, most of the strength in this evolutionary process is focused in stabilizing selection, trying to keep the population at this local optima, and that only rarely will the population be able to shift between it. Now, when that population shifts between it, as we've already said, the then adaptation rapidly happens and populations find that new peak. Now, this leads to a very important prediction from a, a sort of adaptive landscape perspective, and that is that most of evolution is actually stabilizing. Most selective pressure is stabilizing. It's trying to keep you on that peak and that shifts between peaks are quite rapid. Now, this might sound familiar to you as it is one of the big critiques that the paleontologists Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould lobbed against the modern synthesis in the 1970s and 80s. According to them and what they had seen in the paleontological record, the modern synthesis that is mostly focused on selection acting on random variation is incapable of explaining punctuated changes. Again, this is sort of a problem in many components of science, and it's no ex and biology is no exception, is that different subdisciplines don't have a lot of crosstalk between them, right? So paleontologists don't often hang out with population geneticists. Um, I'm on the same floor, actually, at, at my university, I'm on the same floor as the paleontology department. It's just like across the way, and we very rarely socialize. It's, it's actually kind of a shame. Um, and so this leads to differing narratives beginning to form in either of these camps, such that Gould and Eldridge thought that they were providing some critique to the modern synthesis, when in actuality, the pattern that they were observing should have been taken as like a prediction and a verification of the right of the Wrightian view of the adaptive landscape. So this paper basically says exactly that. This is from 1980. And it's titled Neo-Darwinian Evolution Implies Punctuated Equilibria. And I just want to read you their abstract. They write, quote, the two central elements of Neo-Darwinian evolution are small random variation and natural selection. In Wright's view, these lead to random drift of mean population characters in a fixed, multiply peaked adaptive landscape with long periods spent near fitness peaks. Using recent theoretical results, we show here that transitions between peaks are rapid and unidirectional, even though indeed because random variations are small and transitions initially require movement against selection. Thus, punctuated equilibrium, the paleontological pattern of rapid transitions between morphological equilibria is a natural manifestation of the standard Wrightian evolutionary theory and requires no special developmental, genetic, or ecological mechanisms. Hence, the paleontological pattern of stasis followed by rapid change is a straightforward prediction of the adaptive landscape metaphor. Moving on, now that we're on that peak of fitness, we can start to think about another key idea in evolutionary theory, and that is the distribution of mutational fitness effects, or the DFE. So I'm portraying a cartoon version of this up here, so the line right here at zero is neutrality, everything to the left are mutations that are deleterious, everything to the right are mutations that are beneficial. Now, when the population is at the highest possible peak, right, so it is as adapted to this particular environment as it can be, all subsequent mutations are deleterious, right, because they're all going to act to move you away from that peak. And so the distribution of fitness effects should look something like this. We have a very, very broad deleterious distribution and a very tiny sliver of beneficial mutations. And in fact, when you're at the fitness peak, all directional selection, so selection that's actually moving you somewhere, not just trying to stabilize you, is compensatory. Right, so you get a deleterious mutation, it kind of drags the population mean away, you get a beneficial one that just repairs the lost function from the deleterious one, and so it just moves you slightly back up. Right, so all directional selection when you're at this fitness peak is compensatory. Now, this idea of the evolution of the distribution of fitness effects was first put forward by R.A. Fisher in his 1930 book, The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection, and the model is called the geometric model of 
adaptation. And to kind of understand how the distribution of fitness effects can evolve through time, let's take a step back and think about what the distribution would have been when our population was not at the highest peak. So our population is down here. It is at a peak, but it's not the highest peak. And then we can think about all possible mutations that can move that population anywhere on this landscape. Right. So I've just shown this here by a bunch of little lightning bolts. These are mutations that can move that population to various places. Right. There are still a ton of spaces that are deleterious. Right. There's a lot of deleterious spots that 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 any mutation can move you to. Um, but there are many places on this landscape where you would have higher fitness. And there is much more places that you would have higher fitness than if you were at the tippy top. And so what this indicates is that the distribution of fitness effects when you're at a lower peak actually has a much broader beneficial distribution than when you are at a at, at the very top of the of the fitness landscape. So Fisher proposed that the way we can understand the evolution of the distribution of fitness effects is by thinking about how the probability that any mutation is beneficial is a function of the distance that that population is from the phenotypic optimum as well as the size of the mutation itself. So when a population is really, really far from the phenotypic optimum, it can take a bigger step and not be deleterious. So for example, if the population had a, had a mutation of really large effect that moved it from here to here, that's a large effect mutation that is beneficial. But if the population is up here, any large effect is gonna move you off, right? only small effects can perhaps get you a little bit higher right so that distribution is determined by how far away you are from the from the fitness peak as well as how big the mutational effect is and those two things actually interact with one another such that as you get closer and closer and closer to the optimum how big of a step you can take and still climb the peak gets smaller and smaller and smaller this idea was reviewed uh, in this really great paper by H. Allen Orr, who was a, a graduate student of Jerry Coyne, um, and who has done a lot of work in sort of the genetics of adaptation. Um, and he gives a lot of empirical examples of this very sort of thing happening. Um, and I wanna just kind of show you a little diagram here from uh, Fisher's geometric model. So the way Fisher's geometric model is like kind of mathematically conceptualized is you can imagine a population moving through sort of a multi-dimensional hypersphere, right? Um, and there are a bunch of different traits that are all trying to be optimized at once and how far away you are from whatever the, the center point, which is in this model is what the optimum is, how far away you are determines how big of steps you can take and still uh, be walking in the right direction, right? And so here you can see at the very end, you can take these large steps that are moving you in the right direction, but as you get closer and closer and closer to the center, you need to take smaller and smaller and smaller steps, right? And so uh, Eleanor writes, adaptation is therefore characterized by a pattern of diminishing returns. Large effect mutations are typically substituted early on and smaller effect ones later on. These results appear to be reasonably robust to assumptions about the precise shape of the fitness function and the distribution of mutational sizes provided natural selection. So again, we can think about as that population is adapting to this new fitness peak. So when it's actually like taking its steps from our, our lower fitness peak to the higher one, as it's moving through it, the distribution of beneficial mutations, as well as like the effect size of them, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Right. So it's climbing, it's climbing this peak, and as it does, and as it does so, there are fewer and fewer mutations that could be of large effect that can get you to the top. Right. And so I'm just showing that here by this reducing beneficial mutation distribution until you finally get to the distribution where there is plenty, like you know large numbers of possible deleterious mutations and only a tiny sliver of beneficial ones possibly left when you are at that fitness peak. Now, this is a really cool sort of theoretical and conceptual idea, but is there actually any empirical support for this kind of thing happening? 
This is a particularly cool paper. Uh, this is from the Linsky lab. So this is part of the long term evolution experiment um, in which they show this exact thing happening. So they have a population of E. coli that's evolving in a novel medium over 15,000 generations. Um, the way there, this is the distribution of fitness effects down here. The black line represents the ancestral distribution. The blue line is after 2000 generations, and then the red line is after 15,000 generations. So notice initially, as that population is first evolving to the novel medium, it has a much higher proportion of beneficial mutations. But after, by 15,000 generations, that proportion has halved. And so, there, so not only are there fewer, but they are of smaller effect. Right, um, and that's showing here. So this is the broader ancestral distribution, which you can get all the way to effect sizes of like 10% fitness increase. But by the time you're at the 15,000 generations, most are smaller than 5%. Um, another way of visualizing that is here. So this is the fraction of drivers of adaptation uh, on the y-axis and then generations on the x. You can see there's a large fraction of, adap uh, of drivers of adaptation ancestrally. But by the time you're 2000 generations in, most of those have been fixed, right? Especially those of large effect, right? They're, they're rapidly fixed. And then you have fewer and fewer ways to get better in that landscape until finally by 15,000 generations, there is very little improvement that you can, that you can make, right? You are, you are at the peak and you just can't get any better. And any subsequent increase are tiny steps up closer and closer to this peak. Um, again, it's important to remember that when you are on this peak, most directional selection, as I've said, is compensatory. It's just acting to try to keep you on that peak um, as opposed to adapting you any further. Okay, so now we've talked a little bit about movement through the landscape just based on genetic drift and selection, but how does mutation play a role in how populations move through this landscape? So what mutations act to do is they act to sort of make certain trajectories through this landscape easier or harder. Maybe a better way to think about this is more or less probable. So across the genome, there is not a uniform mutation rate, right? Some parts of the genome mutate much easier and much faster than other parts of the genome. So if you can reach a peak of fitness via parts of the genome that are hypermutable, right, then, then that's a much more probable path to to that peak than if you have to wait on some part of the genome to evolve that's much less mutable, right? That's much less likely to actually have mutation. So I'm demonstrating that here by the red line is the most probable, the yellow has some moderate probability, and then the green path is the least probable. And again, this is uh, sort of introducing the concept of how mutational bias, which is the, the difference in the rate of mutation across the genome, that some regions are biased towards higher rates than others, can help sort of guide the path that the population is going to take through this landscape, right? So it's not merely random walks of genetic drift, and it's not merely directional selection. It's also how likely any given path is to exist or how easy it is to traverse that given path based on mutational bias. Um, mutational bias can also shape which peak you can get to in the first place. So let's say there is still this highest peak here in the middle, but it's the least mutationally probable to achieve. In that case, the population may literally just never find it, and it may take the more probable mutational path and evolve in this direction and end up with a phenotype that looks like this, that is of a higher fitness than the one down here, but it is not the highest possible fitness. Uh, similarly, this one has, you know, sort of a moderate probability that you end up on this peak, which is, again, not the highest peak. So the accessibility of any given fitness peak depends on not only genetic drift and selection, but how mutationally probable it is to reach that peak. So this is a pretty cool recent study looking at how easy it is to navigate a fitness landscape. Um, what they did is they had a, a laboratory population of E. coli that are evolving to um, antibiotic resistance. They're evolving to an antibiotic. Um, and they're specifically looking at the fitness landscape of one protein that provides antibiotic resistance. Um, and the way that they were able to, to generate the full fitness landscape is using gene editing technology to substitute every possible amino acid combination in this protein and then measure the fitness effect. So how well they were able to uh, resist the antibiotic 
uh, given whatever protein and amino acid combination they happen to have. So what they discovered is that there were around 500 different peaks all across this, this you know, fitness landscape, um, and that many of these peaks were only a few mutational steps away from the wild type E. coli strain. Um, furthermore, they found that many of the peaks that had the highest fitness actually had what they called large basins of attraction. That means that the actual base of the peak is very broad. So there were many ways that the population could get to that peak. Right. So it wasn't like you can only take one trajectory. There are many ways to get there. Um, and what this shows us is that while mutational bias is very important, in many respects, there are lots of ways to get a given outcome. Right. There's lots of possible combinations that will give you high fitness in a given environment. Another important component of the of the fitness landscape is the actual shape of the peaks themselves. So you can imagine two different kinds of peaks on the extremes. You can have a very tall, narrow peak or a very broad sort of hill like peak right um, and when populations are sitting on that peak we can determine how robust they should be to additional mutations and you know be, still be able to stay on that peak by how narrow the peak is itself right so if the peak is very very narrow um, and very sharp then any subsequent mutation rapidly pulls you off of that peak right and that that's going to lead to a much higher genetic load in that population alternatively if the fitness landscape is such that the peak is very broad, then you can have subsequent mutations that are uh, selectively equivalent, right? And they're just going to spread you out across that peak, but not pull you off of it, right? Um, and we call this genetic robustness. And what this means is that for this particular fitness function, uh, there is a lot more selectively neutral mutations, right? That are not going to be reducing your fitness compared to if the peak is very, very narrow and there's just one or two ways to, to achieve that highest fitness. So another component of the ability for populations to move through this fitness landscape is pleiotropy, right? So you've got a bunch of different traits that are all correlated with one another. And as you, so that such that as you change one, you're, you're impacting another one. So I'm showing up here, the relationship between color and beak size, right? So in this landscape, we're trying to go from black feathers to brown feathers and from a long beak to a short beak, right? And as we're moving through that landscape, we're, both of those things could be correlated with each other and changing as we move, right? And so in the case in which there is no correlation such that these traits are completely independent of each other, uh, that's what I'm showing here, it's a flat line, right? There's, there's no correlation between these two traits, um, then selection is just gonna take a linear path to the highest peak, right? It's gonna just walk that linear path um, and it's not gonna take any wide meandering journeys through that fitness landscape. So the black line here represents um, the sort of the, the linear regression on this expected movement through the landscape with the red representing the noise around it. So this is genetic drift that is the noise around selection that is driving you to this particular peak, right? Real simple if traits are uncorrelated, but if they are correlated such that there's some relationship say between beak size and color, then populations don't take linear walks through the adaptive landscape and instead they can take on many different non-linear paths because of this correlational aspect of different traits right so what pleiotropy acts to do is it biases the direction that you can move through the fitness landscape because you're trying to tune a bunch of different traits all at once. Um, and this idea of correlational selection was first put forward by Landy and Arnold in 1983. This is a super, super important paper for understanding how uh, adaptation can happen on many traits at once, and especially if many of those traits at once are all correlated with each other. So the last concept that I want to, to address here with the adaptive landscape metaphor is how it can lead to speciation itself, right? So imagine our you know, initial population that started off down here and then it evolved to this first little peak, right? Now at this little peak, we've kind of talked about the whole mean moving to subsequent peaks, but it doesn't necessarily have to do that. So imagine the case in which some members of that population cross this valley and begin to climb this new peak, right? It, that doesn't necessarily mean that the whole population climbs the new peak. What's going to determine whether or not the whole population moves is in relation to whether or not those individuals that are climbing the new peak are 
competitively interacting with those on the opposing peak. So for example, let's say that this bird now has the ability to access some new food source. That's not a food source that is, um, that is eaten by this bird uh, or by this phenotype, I should say, such that these two phenotypes are not in direct competition with each other. Now, if that's the case, then you can have a population that remains on this particular peak feeding on its food resource while some members of its pop while some members of the population climb to this new peak and have become isolated on food resources. So this is a kind of ecological divergence where these two existing subpopulations now are diverging from one another phenotypically and based on the food resources that they are acquiring. Now, this doesn't mean that they're reproductively isolated, at least not at first. This could still be considered in some extent a single population, and there could be a cline of variation between them. But if the individuals that fall along that clinal variation all have lower fitness than the individuals at the extreme of that variation, then what will end up happening is matings between the two peaks will get fewer and fewer and fewer because selection is acting against all of the intermediate phenotypes. Furthermore, if an actual reproductive barrier emerges, such as some kind of post-zygotic isolation, like a, like a genetic incompatibility, then that will further solidify these two populations as distinct species. And given enough time, they will accumulate additional genetic divergences such that we would be able to reconstruct their past evolutionary history. So in this way, populations can explore subsequent adaptive peaks within a single community and actually lead to species species divergence via ecological separation. Now, importantly, for this to occur, these populations need to not be in direct competition with each other, right? For this sort of ecological divergence, or another way to call it is niche partitioning, for this to occur, if the two populations are diverging but in competition for the same resource, one is going to win out and the ancestral phenotype is going to go away. Right. So they need to actually be diverging on some kind of different resource within the population. And then that can lead to these sort of stable species boundaries. Now, building this sort of fitness landscape in a community setting where it's actually like a multi species fitness landscape is something we've been doing for a very long time. Um, this is a really, really cool study on the radiation of the Anolis lizards in the Caribbean. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, so the Anolis lizards have actually had this sort of adaptive radiation where they have partitioned trees. So they partition the canopy such that some of them live at the base of the of the tree. Some live um, along the trunk, some live in the crown, some live in the highest part of the canopy, right? So they've partitioned the environment uh, by space. Um, and what these researchers did is they mapped out all of the different traits right, that each one of these different populations had, and they looked at the survival probability given what trait that you had. And so this allowed them to create a community-wide adaptive landscape. And you can see that each one of the different members of this radiation are occupying their own unique peaks, right? So there's no overlap between the peaks that each one are occupying. So if these two, for example, were to interbreed, the, the hybrid offspring would fall somewhere in this valley and selection would act against them, right? And so this difference in the fitness landscape between each of the subsequent uh, species of Anolis lizard is what is reinforcing this, the, the reproductive isolating boundaries between them. Okay, so that is sort of the conceptual idea of the fitness landscape, and it's allowed us to think about how all of the different interacting forces of evolution help to drive adaptation, and that we really can't understand things like adaptation if we don't also think about mutational bias, pleiotropy, genetic drift, all of these additional processes that are also happening, right? Natural selection alone is not sufficient to explain this process. Um, but one of the things that we still should touch on is what do we actually mean when we say increasing fitness? Um, so, you know, the whole point of the adaptive landscape is you're trying to reach points of high fitness. So what does that really mean, right? And this is often confused in sort of the popular science discussion for the general audience. Um, of what we actually mean when we're talking about increasing fitness. And this is because it depends on how selection is acting. And, and selection can act in two distinct ways. 
One is that selection can be what we call hard. That is, it is acting on absolute survival or reproduction, and hence it is affecting the population growth rate. That is, higher fitness populations have an increase in population size because the growth rate is getting larger. So if you can imagine you're climbing this landscape and as you're climbing it, individuals are having more and more and more and more and more offspring. Right. And so as if that's the case, if that's how selection is acting, then the population size is growing. Right. That also means that any kind of purifying selection or any kind of negative selection is whittling down that population. Right. So hard selection is about population growth dynamics. Alternatively, you can have what's called soft selection, and this is selection that is relative survival or reproduction and does not impact population size. So the way we often think about this is more competitive, right? So, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an example of this in just a moment to kind of help you conceptualize these two different ideas. But I want to point out that these are not exclusive concepts. So selection may be hard during the early parts of adaptation. So as the population is climbing that peak selection may be acting in the way that it's on growth rates, the population is growing in size. But once it reaches that peak, selection can shift to become soft because it may be depending on relative competitive interactions between individuals um, based on whatever the uh, population size regulation mechanism is. And again, I'm gonna make that explicit in just a moment. Okay, so first let's give an example of hard selection. So we've got uh, this hypothetical population of roosters with three different phenotypes. So you either have sort of a dark red, bright red, or sort of a burnt orange color. Um, and let's condition that the bright red has the highest fitness. Now in a hard selection environment, that means that they're gonna have more offspring, right? They're gonna like, absolute number of offspring they have is greater than the absolute number of offspring had by any other member in the population. If that continues, right, that every single one of the red have more offspring than everyone else, the population size increases in absolute number. So selection is acting on the rate of population growth, okay? That's hard selection. And I think that's the one we often think about. When we, we talk about concepts like genetic load, for example, um, it was completely and totally derived from the idea of hard selection. Now, soft selection acts a little bit differently. So in this case, to kind of understand this, let's consider um, some finite food resource, right? And that finite food resource is setting a limit on how many individuals can possibly exist within a population. This is often called the carrying capacity, which refers to any sort of resource that a population needs to persist, right? So you can't just grow infinitely in size. The size of the population is strongly limited by the available food resources, okay? Now, in this case, selection is acting on the relative competitive differences between individuals. So if the bright red is better at acquiring food than the dark red, then the bright red phenotype will spread through the population in proportion, but it doesn't mean that it's going to increase in absolute number the population. Right, because again, the absolute number of individuals that can exist in that population are still determined by food resource. So eventually what's gonna happen is everybody is gonna be red, right? That the frequency of that red allele will spread to everyone in the population, but the absolute size will not change because everyone is still feeding on this finite food resource. Soft selection can be in terms of both food resources as well as what's called density dependence, where there is some absolute number of individuals that can be tolerated in any one environment, right? Um, so this is, these are two very important and distinct ways selection can act whether it's on absolute population size in the terms of hard selection, or whether it's on relative competitive abilities between individuals, um, because the population size is actually limited by something like food resource or even like space availability. So these two ideas have really important uh, implications for the concept of genetic load, which we talked about previously. Um, if you are familiar with the famous 1995 Kondrashoff paper, Why Have We Not Died 100 Times Over? Um, this is one that creationists like to cite when they're talking about things like genetic entropy. You've probably seen me um, discuss this several times on this channel, as well as on other people's channels about this idea. Um, 
there's a, a really great response to that paper by Brian Charlesworth that just instead of asking it as a question states outright why we are not dead 100 times over. Um, and he provides the answer to this question of genetic load in, in the following way. So let's think about what the genetic load is based on the type of selection that could be acting. So in hard selection, the genetic load is the proportion of individuals that selection must purge. Right. It must get rid of them because they harbor deleterious variation. And what this does, since selection is acting on the population growth rate, is it depresses the population growth rate. Right. Now, all of the original genetic load models were derived assuming this is the way that selection acts. It is acting on absolute number of individuals within the population. This is often why you see genetic load derivations relying on how many offspring an individual must have to compensate for the loss of, of other individuals with the genetic load, right? Like that, and I've used that exact kind of math in previous videos. However, in the case of soft selection, the genetic load is just the difference between the most and the least competitive in the population. And so long as this the difference between those two is not extreme, then the load is essentially irrelevant in the case of soft selection. Because even if some individual is not as competitive as some ancestor was, there is still a finite food resource that is going to get eaten. Right. Individuals are going to eat it. And so even if I couldn't compete with my ancestor for that same food resource, so long as I am better than my neighbor, I'm still going to be fine. Right. And so that's the way soft selection is much different in terms of the genetic load than hard selection where it's the absolute number of individuals that matters. Now, again, there could still be an intolerable genetic load in soft selection, but the only way it can occur is if the difference between whoever the best, the most competitive is in the population and the population average is very, very large, right? It has to be very large for there to be a, an intolerable load. And there's not really any evidence in nature that such a hypothetical difference in competitiveness exists, uh, especially for like the pop, the difference in the population mean. And so Charlesworth argues that for one, we are not dead a hundred times over because the fitness effect of mutations may not be determined by hard selection, but may instead merely be soft selection in which you can harbor a m many more deleterious mutations, but they don't matter because they're relative to the competitive abilities of individuals as opposed to the absolute population growth rate. Um, additionally, stabilizing selection is another way of getting around why we are not dead 100 times over or the or the hard selection component of genetic load. That is that in stabilizing selection, the genetic load is simply a function of the genetic variance. Right? So we've kind of shown this with the adaptive landscape. So if the population mean is sitting at the peak, the load itself is just the variance around that because it's dragging you off of that peak. So however large the genetic variance in any population is, is going to determine how much genetic load it has under a stabilizing selection uh, form of measuring the load, right? So since the genetic variance in any population tends to be very, very small relative to like the total number of fixed sites in the population, then the genetic load in stabilizing selection regimes is always very small. The only exceptions are when population size is extremely large, that is because the genetic variance gets large, right? And so since the genetic variance is what is determining the load, um, very, very large populations have much higher load and very small populations have a higher load. Again, because stabilizing selection is weaker in them, not necessarily because the genetic variance is higher. Um, so for Charlesworth, the reason we are not dead 100 times over is because selection could very well be soft, acting on differences in competitive ability, or it could be stabilizing. To wrap up and to review all the things we've talked about so far, I think that the adaptive landscape metaphor is a really, really powerful idea in evolutionary biology, specifically for helping us to understand how all of the different forces interact with each other and to really sort of grant us with a a deeper conceptual understanding of evolution. Um, and so we talked about how the adaptive landscape elucidates the relationship between selection, drift, and mutation. Because remember, drift is what's moving you around, especially in those low fitness areas, that's helping you kind of explore uh, potential neighboring peaks. 
mutational bias is what is making certain paths through that landscape more or less likely. And then selection is what is actually taking over and pulling you to that peak. And then once you're on that peak, keeping you on it. Um, second, it demonstrates how selection acts to reduce the genetic variance and how the amount of genetic variance determines the rate of adaptation, right? So this is, again, Fisher's fundamental theorem. So the more genetic variance you have, the easier it is to move through that landscape. But remember, too big of populations can't move through that landscape very efficiently because selection is too strong, right? Um, second is we talked about, or third, we talked about how uh, stasis and rapid adaptation, what paleontologists call punctuated equilibria, is actually predicted from the adaptive landscape, such that the, the, the idea of punctuated equilibria is not novel or even necessary, that it was already a prediction of the adaptive landscape. It's not an idea we even needed to, to ever consider and debate. Um, fourth, it makes clear or clearer what the concept of the genetic load is um, and specifically how the distribution of mutation effects evolve. So again, remember, as a population is moving through that adaptive landscape, especially as it's adapting, the proportion of beneficial mutations begins to shrink towards neutrality. Again, exactly as we would expect if the population is highly adapted uh, to the environment that it's in. Um, we talked about how mutational bias can drive evolutionary patterns. We showed how pleiotropy can act to alter the directionality of selection. So instead of taking a linear path, such as in the case when there's no correlations between traits, you might take a non-linear walk through the adaptive landscape if traits are constantly interacting and changing with one another. Um, and then lastly, we talked about how ecological divergence and stabilizing selection can actually drive the formation of species boundaries. So the adaptive landscape metaphor does a really good job of connecting micro and macro evolutionary processes um, with, by an underlying population genetic framework. So I hope you found this uh, useful and I hope that it um, deepened your understanding of the evolutionary process because I really think the adaptive landscape metaphor is a really powerful idea um, that can help people understand a little bit more about the complexities of evolution and how we think about the evolutionary process. Um, thank you so much for being here. If you have any questions as usual, please feel free to drop them in the comments below um, and I will catch you next time.